You think this is just another day in your life? It's not just another day. It's the one day that is given to you. Today. It's a gift. It's the only gift that you have right now. And the only appropriate response is gratefulness. If you learn to respond as if it were the first day in your life and the very last day, then you will have spent this day very well. Begin by opening your eyes and be surprised that you have eyes you can open. That incredible array of colors that is constantly offered to us for pure enjoyment. Look at the sky. We so rarely look at the sky. We so rarely note how different it is from moment to moment with clouds coming and going. Open your eyes, look at that. Look at the faces of people whom you meet. Each one has an incredible story behind their face. Not only their own story, but the story of their ancestors. All that life from generations and from so many places all over the world flows together and meets you here like a life-giving water if you only open your heart and drink. Open your heart to the incredible gifts that civilization gives to us. You flip a switch and there is electric light. Turn a faucet and there is warm water and cold water. And drinkable water. A gift that millions and millions in the world uh, will never experience. And so I wish you that you will open your heart to all these blessings and let them flow through you. That everyone whom you will meet on this day will be blessed by you. Just by your presence. Let the gratefulness overflow into blessing all around you. And then it will really be a good day.
6 a.m. Success Club Prayer. <clears throat> Today more than ever I find myself in the hands of God. This is what I've wanted all my life for me to serve, to contribute, and to make a difference. Today I enter into the consciousness of abundance and plenty. I know that everything I do will prosper. I know that every demand I make upon the universe will be honored. What I want must be due. What I desire is moving toward me. Today I expect success in everything I do. Today and every day I show up for myself with unconditional love. I show up for all the people whom I'm called to serve. Today is a very important day as someone's life will be touched because I showed up for them. I'm happy to challenge myself this way, give up something I prefer in exchange for something else, more magnificent and meaningful than my comfort. This is how leaders are made, and I, may one, I am one great leader. The world needs me more than any time, and I choose to do this for the world, so help me God. Hello, this is Sandy Gallagher welcoming you back into Lesson 10 of Thinking Into Results. I have a question for you. Are you a leader or a follower? Before you answer, consider this. Do you know how to lead yourself? If you don't, you probably won't be a good leader for anyone else. 
I'm always hearing Bob say that he's both a leader and a follower. He knows when to lead and he knows when to follow. Before you can become a good leader, you have to be a good follower. Take the filming of this video training program, Thinking Into Results. Bob was a follower, a star too, of course, but he was a follower. He said, you tell me what you want me to do, tell me what you want me to say, where you want me to be, and when, and I'm there. And then, when he's in his role as CEO of the holding company, he's telling us what to do. I think this is a really powerful lesson because it moves everyone towards a leadership role. It makes the leader an exceptional leader because they bring out the best in their people and get them to feel good about themselves. A powerful way of empowering others. Are you ready to step into the role of a leader? Stay tuned. I want to share an idea with you that literally changed my life. It changed how I see the world, it changed how I work, it changed how I deal with other people. And it came out of my little book that I have never stopped reading. I've been reading this book, as I said, probably longer than you've been living. I started to read this particular copy in 1963, but I had another copy for a couple of years before that. Now, do you know, I would just wake up in the morning and I'd go and do what ever I thought I had to do. No thought to how I was going to do it. I would just get up and go through my routine. And then I started to study this book and I came across this. Listen carefully. Napoleon Hill said, broadly speaking, there are two types of people in the world. One is known as leaders and the other is known as followers. Decide at the outset whether you intend to be a leader in your chosen calling or remain a follower. Now he said the difference in compensation is vast. Now you see at that time I was deep in debt, I, um, I really had no hope of getting out of debt, but I did have a goal of earning some money. And I was thinking of money, so when he said here the difference in compensation is vast, that's when I got wired into what I'm reading. He said, the follower cannot reasonably expect the compensation to which a leader is entitled, although many followers make the mistake of expecting such pay. Now, he said, it's no disgrace to be a follower. On the other hand, it's no credit to remain a follower. Now, he said, most great leaders began in the capacity of followers. They became great leaders because they were intelligent followers. With few exceptions, the person who cannot follow a leader intelligently cannot become an efficient leader. Now, do you know, I thought about that for a long time. I kept rolling it around in my mind. And of course, I, uh, I had, I was going to say I had chosen to do something different. I didn't choose it. Someone chose me. There was a man chose to help me. He saw something in me that I couldn't see in myself. I guess today we would call him a, a coach or a mentor. He uh, was just another man that spent some time talking to me. And, and he got me onto this book. And so I started to read this, and I was sharing this with him. Well, he said, Bob, you're just really beginning to wake up. And he said, you don't have a lot going for you on the surface, but you've got an enormous power going inside. And as you gain a better understanding, you can go anywhere and do anything you want. Now, you see, I was operating with the idea because I didn't have any specific credentials, I had no formal education, no business experience, that I could never be a leader. Oh, he said, that's not true. He said, some of the greatest leaders that ever lived never saw the inside of a school. Some of them were functionally illiterate, but they understood how to work with other people. I love the way Larry Wilson put it. He said, a leader is a person that has people following them because they want to. People want to follow them. The leader has a vision. They know where they're going, and their people buy into that vision. Now, I didn't understand that when Ray was going over this with me, but he said, Bob, what you want to do is follow what Napoleon Hill is talking about. Become an intelligent follower. 
become the best follower that you're capable of becoming. Because you see, he pointed out in here, the person who isn't a good follower is never gonna be a good leader. Now, this book led me to Earl Nightingale. It led me to study Earl Nightingale's material. Now, listen to this. In Earl Nightingale's Lead the Field program, and this is something that I have studied now for many, many years, since around 1962, Earl's talking about leading. And we can look at it today, leading in the new economy. You see, we're living in a different economy. The economy we're living in today isn't the economy that we were born into. He said every business, every organization, from the smallest to the largest, needs a leader. Now, you see, I already had this idea running around my head from the Think and Grow Rich book. So when I looked at that, he said, every business, every organization, from the smallest to the very largest, needs a leader. He said, they have committees, they are echelons of command, and perhaps a widely dispersed group of semi-autonomous divisions. But the overall company and each of its divisions must have strong and able leadership. Contrary to popular belief, you do not raise morale in an organization. It filters down from the top. The attitudes of the people working in any organization will always reflect the attitude of the leader. And finally, this leader will always be found to be just one person. Now that's important for you to understand. That's important for me to understand. I love the way Chris Haggerty put it one time. He's a management consultant in the West Coast of America. He said, the goal of most leaders is to get the people to think highly of them as a leader. But he said, the goal of the exceptional leader is to get the people to think highly of themselves. Do you know, Earl Nightingale told a story, and it's a story that I remember very clearly. I will paraphrase it, of course. But he talked about even during the Great Depression, when all the businesses had great signs hanging outside, no help wanted. You know, when you see a company that has a sign saying, no help wanted, what they're really saying is, we need help. Because a company is either growing or dying. And if it's growing, they're going to need good people. They're going to need more people. I remember when I went to work for the Mangel Kona Corporation, I sat down with Lloyd Kona and I wanted to work with them. I wanted to work with them so bad because I knew I'd get an education that would be second to none. And I told Lloyd, I said, Lloyd, I've studied your company. The programs that they were marketing told you to do that. I said, I've studied your company and I've studied where you're going. He said, and I said, your company's growing. And I said, you need good people. And I said, I'm a good man. I said, I've got great habits and I want to help you build this company. And do you want me to start today or would you prefer I wait till the middle of the month? He laughed and he looked at me and he said, and what would you expect to get paid for this job that you're going to get? I said, it really doesn't matter, Lloyd. I said, ultimately, I'm going to get what I'm worth. You just give me whatever you want. And that was true. See, if you're very valuable, they don't want to lose you. They're going to pay you. And if you're not very valuable, well, if they lose you, it doesn't really matter. Some people, when they leave, they don't even have to be replaced because they're not doing any consequence anyway. But the story that Earl was telling about during the Great Depression, he knew a man that could get a job anywhere he wanted. When most people would take any job they could get, they were just happy to have work. He would study a company, and he would study what they do. And then he would send a message to the president of the company. And he would say, you know, I have been studying your company and I've been studying your industry and in your company in particular. And I have some ideas that I believe you'll be very interested in that will substantially improve the bottom line on your financial statement. He said, this guy could get an appointment with any executive he wanted because that's what all the executives were looking for. They were looking for someone that could lead them out of the situation they were in. And of course, he always got a job wherever he wanted. Well, do you know, your organization is looking for leadership, for someone that sees himself as a strong leader. Now, a leader always has a great attitude. 
A leader will see the good in other people. They'll attempt to create a situation that brings out the good in the other people. The leader is the person that other people want to follow. You see, you can go and you can study this in, uh, in Harvard or in Eton, but you bring it right down to the smallest and the simplest common denominator, it's a person that operates on a creative plane, it's a person that understands who they are. In other words, developing our own inner leadership, we've got to lead ourselves. And if we don't know how to lead ourselves, we'll never lead anybody else. So we're bringing leadership in this program down to the very basics. It's understanding who you are. It's taking control over your own life. It's having a good attitude regardless of what's going on outside. It's knowing that you have the creative ability and you have the capacity to create anything you want in your world, whether it's on an individual basis or in your team or in your corporation. See yourself as that person and always see the best in other people. Do you know there's far more room at the top than there ever will be at the bottom? Always. And you will just naturally gravitate to the top. These ideas on leadership that I've been studying for many years uh, will not give you a brain hernia. They're simple ideas, but they're ideas that anybody can incorporate into the image they hold of themselves. Hill's talking about the major attributes of leadership. Talks about unwavering courage, you see? It's based upon the knowledge of self and one's occupation. No follower wishes to be dominated by a leader who lacks self-confidence and courage. No intelligent follower will be dominated by a leader like that very long. You've got to have unwavering courage if you want to lead. Do you know, I like the way Earl put it one time. He said, the opposite to courage is not cowardice. It's conformity. It's just going along with the masses, doing whatever the masses are saying. The second point that Hill talks about being essential in leadership is self-control. If you can't control you, how are you going to lead? These are basic concepts. You'll find all these in Think and Grow Rich. In the chapter on organized planning, he said, another one is a, a keen sense of justice. Do you know, we say that God is a just God. Now, a lot of people say, well, I don't believe that because they're letting what's going on outside um, dictate that. But if you study the laws of the universe, you're going to find that everybody gets exactly the same deal. The law is something that happens every time with every person everywhere. The law, in my opinion, is God's modus operandi. It's how the whole scheme of things is run. Well, you have to have a, clean, a keen sense of justice. And he said, Definiteness of decision. Do you know that most people never learn how to make decisions? They've got an idea and they know what to do, but they're looking for approval. That's why they're always saying, what do you think I should do? What do you think I should do? They're frequently asking people that don't think. <laughs> and, and what they're going to get is an opinion. That's based on absolutely no knowledge. You know that every decision has an answer? It does. See, a decision, the opposite to a decided decision, is procrastination. When you ask a question, the question has an answer. You, if you look up in Webster's Dictionary, you'll see that a, a rhetorical question is a question without an answer. I've come to the conclusion that that's a statement, that's not a question. See, questions have answers, okay? Questions have answers. When you ask a question, the answer's there. You've got to be aware of it. And your awareness of the answer is usually the decision you make. But if we don't have the confidence that we require to lead, we're going to be running around saying, what do you think I should do? What do you think I should do? Do you want to follow somebody that's always asking other people, what do you think I should do? I don't think so. He's talking about definiteness of plans. You have some plans. You got to know where you're going. You got to know how you're going to get there. Now understand this. The plan can change. The goal cannot. You do not change the goal. You can change the plan. And since we're making the plans and we're not perfect, we are, in essence, 
but we haven't brought the perfection to the surface, some of the plans are going to be flawed, and we'll have to change them. He said, the habit of doing more than you're being paid for. Do you know, I studied this a long time ago. He said, if you're not doing more than you're being paid for, you're never going to be paid for more than you're doing. It took me years to understand that. I'm not going to explain it beyond there. I want you to think about it the way I've thought about it. If you're not willing to do more than you're being paid for, you're never going to be paid for more than you're doing. Most people are waiting to get paid before they'll do it. That's like standing in front of a stove and saying, give me the heat, and then I'll put on the wood. It won't fly. That dog won't hunt. You've got to understand these things. You have to have a pleasant personality. Who wants to follow someone that's got a mean and miserable personality? I don't think anybody does. These are basic laws of leadership. Sympathy and understanding. Sympathy and understanding. Understanding is really the key. Understanding is the polar opposite to worry and doubt. Understanding can only be accomplished one way, through study. There's no other way. Now, there's many forms of study. But if you want to lead, you must understand. You must understand who you are. You must understand the laws of your being. You have to understand the other person. And you'll never understand the other person if you don't understand yourself. Mastery of detail. Now, do you know what I've found? You don't have to master it yourself, but you have to have people at will. You have to have people at will. You've got to understand how to lead. These are all basics. Willingness to assume full responsibility. See, responsibility is the key to freedom. I like the way Harry Truman had a little sign on his desk. It said, the buck stops here. I take full and complete responsibility for the position that our company is in because I'm the leader in the company. And if I'm not prepared to take responsibility, this company's not going to go very far, very fast. And cooperation. We have to learn how to cooperate. These are basics. They're basics that I don't know as you ever master them, but you can continually improve upon your ability to develop this within yourself. But let's go back to where we started. You are never going to be an effective leader if you're not a real intelligent follower. Don't be afraid to follow. Follow the effective leader. And you know what you're going to learn? You're going to learn how to lead. Pretty soon people are going to want to follow you. And that's when you're going to be the intelligent leader. And remember what Chris Haggerty said. The goal of most leaders is to get the people to think highly of them as a leader. But he said the goal of the effective leader is to get the people to think highly of themselves. Get people to fall in love with themselves. Help them understand who they are. And you'll never have a problem leading other people. And remember what Earl Nightingale said, attitude filters down from the top. You don't raise morale, it filters down from the top. Keep yourself in tune with the higher side of your personality. And you know something, the energy that you send off is gonna be the energy that you'll find come back to you. Become a great leader. You know, I love the point Bob just made about leaders. He said the goal of the exceptional leader is to get people to think highly of themselves. Isn't that a great leadership principle? Understanding your role, both as a leader and a follower, is vital to your well-being at work. Don't be afraid to follow. Follow an effective leader, and you'll learn how to lead. Learn as much as you can about yourself, and you'll be an effective leader. Discuss this concept of leadership with your team. Performing the exercises in the guide will clarify your comfort level with leading and following. You may be surprised at your leadership potential. What kind of leader do you choose to be?
I want you to ask yourself, what do I really want? Because if you really get this, and if you commit, and you're going to ask you to commit right here towards the end of this, you can have anything you want. Now, that's a beautiful statement. You can have anything you want. You know, something just flashed on my mind. I had a friend, Ty Boyd. I haven't seen Ty for years, but Ty and his whole family went through the seminars that I was doing oh, back around, <laughs> around 1970, 69, 70, down in Charlotte, North Carolina. And Ty was a radio broadcaster, well-known. Everybody in Charlotte knew Ty. He had the morning show. And he was on the radio for years. Now... I was doing a series of seminars for, with Bill Morris. God, I haven't thought of Bill for years. And Ty and his whole family came to that seminar. He was uh, just, an, he is an incredible guy. He had an interesting idea one time. He would phone very successful people, and he would talk to them early in the morning. He had the morning talk show. And he'd catch people going to work. Well, one day he, uh, he got H.L. Hunt, who, uh, he's the guy that said, if you know how much you're worth, you're probably not worth very much. He's the man that cornered the silver market one time, the Hunt family down in Texas. And he phoned Mr. Hunt, and he said, could you give us some simple rules for winning? And Hunt says, yeah, I can. He said, tell the people to decide what they want to decide what they're prepared to give up to get it, to set their mind to it, and get on with the work. That's what I'm going to suggest you do right now. Decide what you want, decide what you're prepared to give up to get it, set your mind to it, and get on with the work. Now, if you will do that, you're going to have a pretty interesting career in sales. Okay? Go after what you dream about, and you'll, you'll love it. Now, in 1970... I had the very good fortune, which right around the time I was working with Ty Boyd, um, I had the very good fortune of um, speaking at the Human Resource, Resource Congress at the Hyatt O'Hare Hyatt in Chicago. And it was a Human Resource Congress, and Eric Hoffer was receiving the Human Resource Award. Eric Hoffer was a grand old man. He's gone now, God bless him. But Eric Hoffer never, never was inside of a school, never went to school. He was a Russian immigrant. He came over with his dad as a small boy, and he never did go to school. But he always had a library card, and he was a ferocious reader. I mean, he was reading all the time, and he turned into a very good author. If you want to get a good book, there's a little book, and you'll love it. It's called The True Believer. Uh, Eric Hoffer wrote it. But he said something at that conference that I'll never forget. Now, in 1970, things were clipping. They were moving along pretty good. Um, and the... Um, Future Shock by Alvin Toffler had just come out. And it was all about change. And Toffler was predicting on what was going to happen over the next 50 years. And everybody in our industry, of course, since we deal with change, was very interested in Toffler's book. And we were talking about it a lot. It was bestseller. And some of the predictions he made were just absolutely ridiculous to me and to most other people that read the book. But you know, <laughs> we've lived long enough to see everything he was talking about come and go. And the truth is that he was shooting low. We went beyond what he predicted. Rather interesting. Well, the reason I mention this is because Eric Hoffer was talking about change. And he says, in times of rapid change, the learners will inherit the earth. Well, the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. There's no such thing as a learned person. Isn't that interesting? There is no such thing. There's no such thing as an educated person. No such thing. You're either learning or you're not. He said the learners will inherit the earth. I took that to be metaphorical for um, you will be happy, healthy, and wealthy. The learners will. The learned, they're toast. The people that think they know it all, they're not going to do it. Now, he also said something else that I found rather interesting. 
He said, to learn, you need a certain degree of confidence. Right towards the end of this program, we've been talking about confidence. He said, you need a certain degree of confidence, not too much and not too little. He said, if you have too little confidence, you'll think you can't learn. If you have too much, you'll think you don't have to learn. Now, I want you to think of this for a moment. There's only 28 pages here. And many of them say some of the same things. If you will commit right now to study this religiously, don't study anything else, study it religiously, I guarantee you, you will turn into one of the best salespeople that you've ever known. Now, I'm one of the best salespeople I know. I don't mind admitting that. It's not conceit. It's just... It's just a statement of fact. I am one hell of a good salesman. But you know something? I know much good in anything else. I don't want to do anything else. I just want to sell. I remember one time I was working with Ed McMahon, who's gone now. <laughs> Most of the people I know are gone. And he said, I'm just a salesman. He was selling for Johnny Carson for years, but before that he was, he was selling everything, doing commercials. And we were talking about it, and we were talking about how selling is such a phenomenal profession. Absolutely incredible. Because you can earn so much money, and you can have so much fun, and you can enjoy so much freedom. I mean, there's nothing like it. This little document, 28 pages. If you will study this, and I'm going to give you just a part of it that you really want to focus on, you will just be amazed. You'll start to do, you'll start to follow the steps in here. There's a series of steps that you follow. And you'll start to follow them unconsciously. And when things aren't going right, you'll back up mentally and you'll start ahead again. Makes sense. That's what this is about. Now, what do you want to do? All you really have to do is become aware. That's it. You see, there's a marvelous inner world that exists within you and me. It's just absolutely incredible. An inner world. Everything comes from the inside out. And I've been reading an article, um, entering into the spirit of it, every day since December 1. And it's a phenomenal thing. And what it's talking about is go to the root cause of everything. Well, that relates here. There's a marvelous inner world that exists within you and me. And the revelation of such a world enables us to do, to attain, and to achieve anything. That's pretty big, you know. Anything we desire within the bounds or limits of nature. Do you know what that means? If you can see it, you can have it. If you can see it, you can have it. It will be yours. Now that's pretty big. So let's start looking here. Here's the first page. I'm going to go page by page with you. Pass to agreement. That's what professional selling is all about. That's really what it's all about. Pass to agreement. You are getting another person to go down a path of agreement. You're going to find out something they want. You're going to mix it with something you've got, and you're going to give it back. All cooked, all baked, all ready to serve. It's going to be kind of nice. Now, I'm going to ask you to flip over to page three. Flip over to page three. And what we're talking about here are four powerful concepts about building your business. And the first one is professional. Professional. Do you know, make up your mind that if you're not already, that you're going to be a real pro. There's no cutting corners. There's no trying to get a person out of the corner, get a check and get out. That's stealing. I want you to become a real professional. Now, we've got a couple of definitions here. In fact, we got three. One who engages in a pursuit or activity professionally. Mm. I'll let that go. 
Number two, one who attempts to do a better job today than yesterday. I think that's better. But the third is one I got from a mentor of mine, and it's one I absolutely love. So it's the one I locked into. It's the person who's at their best regardless. It doesn't matter what happens. You're going to give it everything you've got. I was talking to my son last week, and uh, we were in a program, and he was sick. So I said, go to bed. And he said, did you ever work when you were sick? <laughs> I said, yeah, I worked when I was sick. You know, I worked, and I'm feeling just absolutely terrible. You've got to set it aside, and you've got to focus. And I told him about one time I was, uh, I was speaking at a convention for the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company at Mackinac Island over in Michigan. And they have there a, uh, a theater. It was a theater for plays. It would be like off-Broadway plays. Maybe you go there. I don't know. And that's where the convention was. And so they had quite a lot of people. I mean, there's a few hundred people. And the stage was a real stage, like they had backdrops and everything. And I was doing a three-hour presentation at this convention. And fortunately for me, I gave them a workbook. I I don't like speaking for three hours without giving something to the people so that when it's over, they're not going to wonder what they heard. Well, I'd get to a certain point and I'd be sick. Man, was I sick. And I'd have them do an exercise. I would go backstage. I could go outside and I would throw up and I would come back in and start all over again. And I did that for three hours. Man, was I sick. So when Brian asked me, he said, did you ever work when you were sick? Yeah. I said, yeah, I have. I have. I worked when I was sick. Well, these are four powerful concepts for building your business. You've got to be professional. You just have to be professional. And I love that one who is at their best regardless. I got that from Bill Gove. Bill Gove was a pro. No question about it. He's gone too. God bless him. But he was a mentor of mine, and he was just quite a guy. Now, the second one is about selling. And that's a pretty interesting concept. Selling is having your ideas accepted, adopted, or approved. And the second one is to lead another person a path of agreement. Well, you pretty well know which one I chose there. Now, these are my choices. You could choose a different one if you want. I'm just sharing where I'm coming from. And it's working for me and has been for half a century at least. Um, to lead another person in a path of agreement. So when I go on a sales call, that's what I'm going to be doing. That's what I'm going to give everything I've got to, to lead. And that's what I want to do with you right now. I want to lead you in a path of agreement. I want you to see what I'm teaching here is of real value. I'm going to tell you, the money and the time that you invested for this It'll probably be the bar biggest bargain of your life. It is quite extraordinary. And you'll see that as we get into it. Now, some of us want to build a team. If you're going to build a team, you've got to get involved in management. You just have to. Now, I only have one concept for management. I've always had it. It's the development of people. Now, a lot of people treat management like it's the direction of things. That's not managing. That is not managing. Management is the development of people. It's you can look and you can see more inside of a person than they can see in themselves. And your job is to help pull that to the surface. That's what managing is all about. I have always attempted to be a real good manager. And I've always wanted to be better. I want to see more than the people that I'm managing can see. I tell them frequently, if you could only see you like I see you. Oh, man, I can think of some right off the top of my head. And they're just so great. They haven't got the picture yet. They're getting it. They keep getting better. Well, that's if you're in management. If you're building a sales team, that's definitely where it's at. The development of people. How do you do that? You do it with suggestions. Suggestions. You do it by seeing things about them that they don't see about themselves. You assure them they're quite capable of doing it. Even if they're scared. 
they can do it. And the last part, of course, is where we really tap into the mind, and that's on psychology. So they are the four things, professional, sales, management, psychology. They're the four subjects that we're going to cover here. And you get into psychology, we call the science of the mind and behavior. And I suppose that's what some people would call psychology, the science of mind and behavior. Now, I have another definition that I prefer here. And the study of the mind and behavior in relation to a particular field of knowledge or activity. And of course, since we're talking about selling, that gets the ribbon here. Okay? To study the mind and behavior. It's a study of the mind and behavior in relation to a particular field of knowledge or study. Now, for an individual to become a real professional salesperson, an understanding of the mind and of psychology is absolutely essential. Uh, I love the way uh, James Lincoln, he was president of uh, Lincoln Electric many years ago, and he put it very well. He said, America leaves its greatest resource largely untapped. And that resource, of course, is the intelligence, the initiative, the productive power latent in every individual, not just some, every individual. Now think about that for a moment. You and I are God's highest form of creation. We've got potential, infinite potential. We'll never draw it all to the surface. There's no end, no beginning, no end to it. No one knows what we're capable of doing. Your spiritual DNA is perfect. There's perfection within you. And you don't have to make it better. It's there now. That's you. That's the real you. It's perfect. All you have to do is become aware of the perfection within you. And that's what Lincoln's saying. America leaves its greatest research, we could say. Poland does. Germany does. Um, England does. Australia, South America. The world leaves its greatest resource largely untapped. And that resource, of course, is the intelligence, the initiative, the productive power latent in every individual. Have you any idea what you're leaving on the table? Now think about it. 